Welcome to another Answers in Jubilees, produced by The God Culture. This book has taken us on quite a journey of ancient knowledge that, frankly, we never should have lost. We are in awe just testing it, which it more than passes as Torah, inspired scripture, and yes, canon. Yeah, the only Old Testament canon that counts in history, in fact. This book was kept and used as Torah in the temple. That's Bible canon. Real Bible canon, not your Pharisee Bible canon that the Catholic Church continued for the Old Testament. That's not the right one. Read the introduction if you have not. Try to debate in ignorance without reading. Well, you all know what's next. Our channel, our rules. You will be muted. There you go. In this installment, it's time to address one of the most famous stories of all time. Sodom and Gomorrah and their neighbors, five in total, who were destroyed for what? Well, from the pulpit, we many times hear, because of homosexuality. Well, we will show you, though, Sodom was exceedingly sinful and deviant in every sexual area. And that is not the topic of this story, however. Not homosexuality, no. It is a side note within the story, not what the story is about. It's certainly not in Genesis, nor any passage for that matter, here in Jubilees either. This is far larger in scope, as if Yahuwah certainly destroys all cities rampant in homosexuality, then why is San Francisco still there? I mean, even Tel Aviv, the homo capital of the world. Really? Why is it not destroyed? Because that is not his response to homosexuality. The notion is ridiculous. Oh, they will be judged in the end, and it is sin. But so will all those who are not in relationship with Yahusha. Yes, again, that's sin. And a sin in Sodom, even. Yes, those are true. But what it is not is the theme of this story. Yet you'll find many pastors and theologians who only harp on that in this entire passage. And it is inept, illiterate to Scripture. They don't know it. They don't represent it. This is the story of sin indeed and Yahuwah's response, but this is far too severe of a reaction to be such. As again, he's never done it to any other city for that reason, nor did he with Sodom. Otherwise, it would be calling him inconsistent, and he is not. No, this is far worse. Some say, well, they weren't hospitable. That's why. Really? Have you ever been to New York City? <laughs> there are many not so hospitable there. Even a lot of small towns for that matter. It doesn't have to just be a big city. Now, what about China? I mean, as any... Uh, there are better areas, but I got to tell you, we visited Shanghai and we did not feel welcome at all. Again, none being destroyed for it. Is that a sin of Sodom? Indeed. But that's not enough to bring on this kind of judgment. They're missing the entire story. There's much more to this, and we will explore this now as all believers should know this. As well, in the next video, as this will be a two-part series within a series, we'll go into some of the science behind the matter. We're not going to cover it all, but uh, it not only proves such destruction occurred, and it certainly did, just as the Bible says it did exactly, in fact, but there's really no other history to explain this. This is real. The Bible is real. These are not fictional accounts, not the flood, not creation, and certainly not even Sodom. You know, Moses did not need to make up fairy tales to scare people from sinning. That's really stupid. And you hear that from many scholars, unfortunately. They don't believe the Bible. They saw the very physical presence of Yahuwah himself on Mount Sinai. Now, what kind of moron goes on to call 
themselves a scholar and claim that that is fiction based on, oh, a lightning strike or, oh, a meteor hit in backward reasoning, really, of a child. Again, these make themselves stupid, not scholarly, and they don't deserve a platform. But let's dive in. Time to learn. Open your book of Jubilees to chapter 16, beginning in verse 5. And in this month, now, if you go back to verse 1, you'll find that's the fourth month. Yahuwah executed his judgments on Sodom and Gomorrah and Zeboim and all the region of the, what's that, the Jordan? Huh. That's kind of odd because no one places Sodom on the Jordan River. They place it on the Dead Sea. Why? Well, we'll get there. Now, it's actually five total cities mentioned, and he burned them with fire and brimstone. Now, what is that? We'll cover that too. And destroyed them until this day. The writing of this book. Realize this is Jubilees, written by Moses, who lived around 1700 BC or so, and Sodom is still destroyed as of then. Why? Why has no one rebuilt there? Realize we did cover the Tower of Babel, but, you know, that area was rebuilt later. This one still is not by the days of Moses, and we're going to follow this through history. There's a very good reason, and we'll explore this. Even as, lo, I have declared unto thee all their works, that they are wicked and sinners exceedingly, and that they defile themselves and commit fornication in their flesh. Now, that's not just homosexuality. It's every abomination. And actually, even idol worship is defined as fornication by Yahuwah many times in Scripture. And work uncleanness on the earth. Now, not that is typical in indication to idol worship. Uh, which is fornication scripture. Look it up, and in the dictionary it says, see Catholic Church. (laughs) Teasing. Well, not really. And in like manner, Elohim will execute judgment on the places where they have done according to the uncleanness of the Sodomites. Ah, those Sodomites, right? Homosexuals, right? That's absolutely wrong. Utterly wrong. It's illiterate. Yes, homosexuality is sin, and it is a sin of Sodom, even, some, but they were far worse than that. There's much more to this than something that simple. Like unto the judgment of Sodom, but Lot we saved, for Elohim remembered Abraham, and sent him out from the midst of the overthrow. And he and his daughters committed sin upon the earth. This is interesting such as had not been on the earth since the days of Adam till his time. What did he do? For the man lay with his daughters. Oh, interesting. Did you know that? There was no incest, not father-daughter. No. Specifically, until this day of Lot, since Adam. Wow. That's incredible. To think about. Because, yes, no doubt, they married their sisters. And Cain married his sister. He had nobody else to marry, so he had to marry somebody. And had children with his sister. But, again, their DNA was pure back then. And incest was not something, not brother or sister. It was not forbidden. In fact, it was encouraged. It's what they needed to do. Be fruitful and multiply. The male needed a female. Had to happen. And they kept that through a number of generations. And then you see them shifting. We covered this in the Wives of the Patriarchs. You see them shifting to the cousins, really. And um, even in the, uh, by the days of Abraham, you see that regularly. Abraham, of course, married his half-sister, not full sister, half-sister. So, again, same, same concept. And behold, it was commanded and engraven concerning all his seed on the heavenly tablets. Now, there we go again, but a well-ingrained biblical concept, heavenly tablets. You've heard of the book of life, a heavenly tablet, 
Again, read the introduction and you'll see Paul and Luke say the same and reinforce Jubilees in that. And by the way, you also see it in the book of Enoch and others. To remove them and root them out and to execute judgment upon them like the judgment of Sodom, a theme reoccurring throughout Scripture many times over, even throughout the New Testament and Messiah himself. And to leave no seed of the man on earth on the day of condemnation. Wow. That's the day of final Judgment. That's what that's talking about. It's not talking about Sodom. And the flood's already over. This is Abraham's day. So it doesn't work. And this is just a reality that if a man sleeps with his daughter, it is so forbidden and such a major error that he will be wiped. His seed will be wiped from the face of the earth. Wow. Jubilees mentions Sodom again later in chapter 36, verse 10. Let's go there. But on the day of turbulence, tribulation, and execration and indignation and anger. Now, what day is this? This is the final day of judgment. And yes, Moses knew of that way back then. We just saw it in the previous verse. With flaming, devouring fire as he burnt Sodom. So, definitely the final destruction by fire on the Day of Judgment here. That's what it's saying. We do have a video coming, that we're going to talk about that in Jubilees. Because it is a prevalent, uh, prophetic uh, nature of Jubilees that you don't get in Genesis. And it is amazing. So, likewise, he will burn his land and his city and all that is his Let's not forget, though, that the ownership of the earth remains with Yahuwah. He gave man dominion, yes, and though the earth chooses to allow Satan to usurp such, which is why he is the God of this earth, he is their God, he doesn't own it. He's never had ownership of the earth and he never will. Now, that is another doctrine of men that you do hear from the pulpit in some doctrines, some denominations. It's not from the Bible. And he will be blotted out of the book of the discipline of the children of men and not be recorded in the book of life. Ouch. Now, that can only be the day of final judgment. But wait, Moses covers that in Jubilees. Oh, again, we have a whole video coming on that. Moses mentions this in Jubilees again in chapter 20, so let's go there. Verse 4. Now this is Abraham teaching Jacob, Jacob. And if any woman or maid commit fornication against you, burn her with fire. So that's the way you deal with idolatry uh, and fornication, both. And let them not commit fornication with her, after their eyes and their heart. Now notice, a lot of people say that Messiah just made that up brand new, but here you have Abraham saying the same thing, that even to lust in your heart is sin. See, it's not new. And let them not take to themselves wives from the daughters of Canaan. For the seed of Canaan will be rooted out of the land. Wow. And he told them of the judgment of the giants? You mean the Nephilim? I, I, wait, wait a minute. Abraham was preaching about the Nephilim to Jacob? Wow! Yes, he was. Abe knew this. Why don't modern scholars? That's the real question. Because many are clueless. And the judgment of the Sodomites. Well, you mean homosexuals? No. Ridiculous. This is not the story and really a lousy use of the word and a horrible doctrine to use this passage to solely beat on homosexuals who indeed are in sin, just as you and I have been. So let's love them. This is one of the very illiterate doctrines in the church, though. A sodomite is a sinner, specifically with fornication and idol worship. For definition, see Catholic Church. Oh, just teasing. Well, not really. 
Indeed, fornication of all sorts, not just homosexuality, uh, bestiality, every kind, uh, but certainly included, no doubt. Now, your preacher calling out homosexuals as such may actually be a sodomite himself. How about that? <laughs> because a sodomite is a sinner. We need to restore these definitions and quit these false paradigms that really have no purpose. That one especially doesn't. Now, how they had been judged on account of their wickedness. That's general, not specific to homosexuality indeed. And had died on account of their fornication. All sorts, including idol worship. And you'll see that in this passage. Hold on. And uncleanness and mutual corruption through fornication. Again, homosexuality included, but not all in any sense. Still Abe speaking to Jacob, Jacob. And guard yourselves from all fornication. All. Got that? Sodom was guilty of all. Many in the church are guilty of other forms, just as bad as homosexuality. Let's call it what it is. Sin. And uncleanness. And from all pollution of sin. There's a list here. It's not that one, you know, sub piece of the one thing. All. This is a broad rebuke, never specific to homosexuality. And that's not even what they wanted with the angels here. You'll see. We'll cover that in the next video. Lest you make our name a curse and your whole life a hissing and all your sons be destroyed by the sword and ye become accursed like Sodom and all your remnant as the sons of Gomorrah. That's a lot more than one sin, is it not? And this applies to you and I and all of us. We must all guard our hearts against all sin. And that's what the story of Sodom is really about. It's far greater. But there's a bigger thing there, even in the area of fornication, that we're going to cover next, and it's going to blow some minds, I, I would imagine. Turn to chapter 22, verse 22b, basically. Just the end for this point, but read it all. And into the place of condemnation will they go, as the children of Sodom were taken away from the earth, so will all those who worship idols be taken away. See, what is the key point here? All sin and all abomination was rampant in Sodom. There's a list. Not only just one specific uh, brand of fornication, but all. And that includes idol worship, especially one of the main problems. And that exists today, even in the church, in many. Now today we have whole churches and religions who conduct such. Let's go over Genesis to Genesis, and we'll dive into history a uh, little in this video, and science in the next. Let's explore first the actual location of Sodom, Gomorrah, and the other cities destroyed here. Where were they? Where are they now? Why have they not been found in archaeology, for instance? There are actually some looking for that. And, uh, well, talk about a false paradigm. What exactly are they looking for? I mean, structures that Yahuwah says he destroyed? Hmm. What kind of impotent Elohim do they serve? Not the one from the Bible. When he destroys, he does so for good. No one will ever find a structure from Sodom, likely. I mean, it just probably will never happen. It doesn't need to happen. We don't need it to prove the story. In fact, we have science. However, there is archaeological scientific evidence that we'll cover. Let's go to Genesis 14, and this will really nail this down. Now, we covered this before in the two Melchizedek videos. So, read it all, but we're going to go to the heart of this as we are looking for geographic markers for where Sodom is located. 
We will find it because the Bible is that brilliant and few scholars have. This is the war of the title kings we covered before. But here's verse 3. It says, all these were joined together, the, the forces they were battling, in the valley of Sidim. Sodom is in the valley of Sidim. That's where these cities are. Now, check this out, though. Where is it? Which is the salt sea? Uh, wait a minute. Did I read that right? I mean, it, it cannot be right. This valley is now the Salt Sea or Dead Sea. Hmm. How did they fight in the Salt Sea or Dead Sea? Was it a naval battle? Well, no, it wasn't. My friends, the Salt Sea did not exist in such form that we see today prior to the destruction of Sodom which created it. Oh yes, this is going to be good. We are going to prove that out. Now verse 8 affirms, yes, they did battle in the valley of Sudin, as we said, what we now call the Dead Sea or Salt Sea. Yeah, when you buy cosmetics from the Dead Sea, well, you're applying nutrients of the dead of Sodom. <laughs> uh, nice, uh, just saying. Got to get me some of that. Not. Okay, verse 10. Then demonstrates a point that many overlook, and this is most important. The Valley of Sidim. They found it hard to fight there. Why? Because that valley, that's not a lake, it's a valley. That valley was full of slime pits, tar pits, asphalt, or Pitch is the Bible word you see many times. Wow. So before there was a Dead Sea, which is actually scientifically a lake, not a sea. Let's call it what it is. But that's okay because this Hebrew word yam, interpreted sea, really means large body of water. That's it. Uh, it is used for the Nile River. Uh, so that's just a large body of water. And that's a river. That's not the ocean. It's not a sea. And other bodies uh, as well in similar fashion. It's not specific to oceans or what we call seas today. We cover that in our Tigris videos in our Rivers from Eden series if anybody wants to explore that further. So wait a minute. You mean to tell me under the Dead Sea are tar pits? Asphalt? No way, right? Well... Let's go to science and see what it says. It turns out this is another one of those anomalies scientists cannot explain. Nor will they ever because, well, they don't believe the Bible or even consult it. Which is, by any reasonable definition, well, just plain stupid. Ignoring written history of this event, which this science explains. It's right there, these match. Large blocks of asphalt has been found in the Dead Sea floating to the surface in modern times. Science tells us, well, they don't know where this could possibly come from. Maybe it's the aliens, right? I mean, that's what ancient aliens would tell you, which would be stupid as well. But the Bible tells us exactly, and this is evidence, that the Bible is fact. Science assumes these came from the bottom, which is reasonable and actually accurate. And, well, they certainly didn't come from outer space. But do they bother to then check and see, well, what, maybe there's, I don't know, there could be an ancient document or an ancient writing that might actually connect it? Nah, not the Bible, ooh. Yeah, so they'll just guess because, well, that's smarter, right? Does it sound smarter? That's called academic? No, that's called stupid in reality. And those of us that live in reality know better. Yeah, we reject that. There is no need to presume nor guess. These came from under the Dead Sea, says the Bible, multiple times over thousands of years of history. Check this out. 
Deuteronomy 29, 23. We're not going to read it all, but you can read it. Go there if you're listening to podcast. Check it out. Not only does Scripture record Sodom and the cities of the Valley of Sidim as desolate in those days when it was destroyed, but still, Moses does in his age, about 1700 B.C. or so. Of course, he wrote Genesis as well, but this makes sense and it coalesces. No grass grows there, no trees. It is still barren in the time of Moses. In about 600 B.C., the prophet Zephaniah, in chapter 2, verse 9, records former Sodom and Gomorrah as a breeding of nettles, or weeds, not sea nettles, weeds, uh, at least that's what the Bible dictionaries say, uh, salt pits, though sea nettles would fit because it's in the Dead Sea now, but actually not because no life lives there, <laughs> salt pits and is perpetually desolate. In other words, it has been, since its destruction, desolate. The prophet Ezra records in 2 Ezra 2, 8, and 9. If you haven't read our version of 2 Ezra, the hidden book of prophecy, check it out. Uh, the content's free in ebook at 2esdras.org. He writes of Sodom and Gomorrah, whose land lies in clods of pitch and heaps of ashes, even still in his time. This is no fairy tale, folks. It's fact. And what's pitch? Asphalt, still recorded right there. Even Josephus discusses Sodom as formerly in a valley of slime pits, really originating in Genesis. But look what he says here. Where is Sodom? For at that time, before Sodom's destruction, there were pits in that place where Sodom. He's talking about Sodom. But now, upon the destruction of the city of Sodom, that valley became the Lake Asphaltites, as it is called. What lake is this? Well, it's called the Dead Sea today, which is a lake, not a sea, and that is the Greek name for the Dead Sea. Well, let's just take a look at that. The Greeks knew the Dead Sea as Lake Asphaltites, Asphaltites, however you say it, due to the natural surfacing of asphalt. How about that? Ah, see, asphalt surfaced there even in the Greek period, which is about 800 to 150 B.C. Uh, it's from the bottom of the lake. Indeed, it is the Dead Sea. That is Sodom. It's there in the midst of the Dead Sea. Now, Aristotle wrote about the remarkable waters. During the Egyptian conquest, it is said the Queen Cleopatra obtained exclusive rights to build cosmetic and pharmaceutical factories in the area. Wow, an Egyptian aim come back to life today. Can't imagine. You know, that old Dead Sea mud, even the Egyptians knew its value. But understand, you are applying the nutrients of dead sodomites <laughs> and their homes when you do so. Just saying. Hmm. Now, figures the occult Egyptians would figure that out and bathe in it. You know, you don't really see a reference to that in Qumran, for instance, which is where the temple priests live. Again, read the introduction, and we prove that out there. It's certainly not in the Bible. No, nothing talks about floating in the Dead Sea or going to the beach there. I mean, you know, David was in Ein Gedi to hide, but... There's nothing that says that they went swimming in the Dead Sea and uh, that it was a tourist attraction, necessarily, uh, until maybe the days of, of Herod and the Persians and, you know, the occultists made it such. No one truly knowing the history of this place would really want to swim there, nor apply its mud, regardless of nutrients, really. I mean, ew. Later, the Nabataeans discovered the value of bitumen, which is 
pitch or asphalt extracted from the Dead Sea needed by the Egyptians for embalming their mummies. So essentially the Dead Sea is actually a lake formed by the destruction of Sodom and the other cities. It was not a lake prior to that, according to the Bible. Even called Lake Asphalt, basically, <laughs> in Greek, for its floating asphalt from underneath, just as the Bible says, gee, how is it that those scientists couldn't even look at history that isn't even the Bible? Wow. But Josephus says even more, and this is interesting. Here's Josephus again, and the link's on the screen if you want to go there and read it for yourself. But Lot's wife continually turning back to view the city as she went from it, and being too nicely inquisitive what would become of it, although God, Elohim, had forbidden her to do so, was changed into a pillar of salt. Now that's the Genesis account indeed, but check this out. Josephus says, for I have seen it, and it remains at this day. Well, seen what? I'm not sure how some out there read this as he saw remnants of Sodom, the city. He didn't say that. That's not even the subject here. He's saying he saw the pillar of salt that once was Lot's wife. Is it true, though? Well, we've caught Josephus lying before. You know, he is a Pharisee. Watch. Where did Noah's Ark land? Um, and the Nephilim Ark, whoops, did Ron Wyatt find the Nephilim Ark? Um, those are very good videos that expose Josephus for lying about the Ark and using an occult account. So the photo in the background is what, in modern times, many in Israel, uh, yes, even supposed scholars, call this pillar of salt. You know, Lot's wife turned to a pillar of salt. The only problem is they they can't seem to read because Lot's wife was turned while they were in the valley still. And this sits on a mountain, rather inept and certainly not scholarship. You know, even a simple amount of testing would show them that that was not very bright, but they do it anyway. If somehow this pillar remained in Josephus' day, if that is true, no one has found it today, and it's no longer there. But you don't just put together some rock formation. I mean, it's like looking at the clouds. I mean, oh, I think it's a heart. Oh, no, that was a, oh, it's an elephant. <laughs> I mean, come on. We do that with our kids. It's fun. It's great to speculate. So it's not scientific in any sense. So it just undermines their credibility when scholars do stuff like that. And that's why the occultists, the atheists, have a field day with them in debate. And it's time to stop that. There's a fairly viral video out there, uh, video out there of the Holy Land, which covers this, and he actually says that in fact. And the guy doesn't even know the story, but completely lives in a church paradigm keeping him ignorant. He focuses really heavily on homosexuality, which he's trying to justify a church doctrine that just is not there in the passage. Um, and he claims that uh, Sodom has to be on dry land, and he doesn't even get that it's under the Dead Sea. That's where it is, according to Scripture, anyway, if you believe it. I mean, you've got to kind of believe Scripture in order to understand it. What was the area of Sodom before its destruction? When Lot first saw it, it was well watered everywhere, a fertile land, even as, notice that word, as the garden of Yahuwah. Now, that's called a metaphor. No, the Garden of Eden is not the Dead Sea. That would be illiterate. And we've already proven in this series, in this book of Jubilees, in fact, that's in the Far East, really the Philippines. Watch those videos, attempt to bait on this side note here, and you will be muted. Our channel, our rules. So where is Sodom? It is in the valley of Sidim, which once had slime pits or asphalt. It is now under the Dead Sea. 
This is where some scientists who can't read guess, well, maybe a meteor hit this area. Yet, look at this map. All the scientific evidence points to exactly what the Bible says happened. And we will cover that next in more detail. It does appear as an impact zone, no doubt, but not from a meteor but from the judgment of Yahuwah, fire and brimstone from heaven. This is why this area of former Sodom in the valley of Sidim, now covered by the Dead Sea, appears to have been impacted. Oh, it was by fire and brimstone. We'll cover in more detail next. So here we have more answers in Jubilees, and we've expounded, of course, with history and other Bible. Indeed, which we will do, and when matched with other scripture, the book of Jubilees coalesces. In the next videos, we will continue this track, dealing, actually next video, oh, just one more on, on Sodom, uh, dealing with the science of Sodom's archaeology, uh, and we'll explore and find brimstone and the elements of this disaster right there in what is termed and known as the very lowest place on earth. As land goes, that's what it's known as. I mean, where else would Sodom be but the very lowest place indeed? We have over 350 videos on this channel, many just as profound with some 50 or so in Tagalog for Filipinos, and now a uh, six in Spanish to start. We recently uploaded all our content to Rumble, and also Utreon is processing right now. Uh, links are in the description box. Those are two alternatives to YouTube, which many viewers have been requesting for quite some time. Don't forget to like and subscribe and click the bell for notifications of new uploads, but join our email list as YouTube fails to notify often, and we will notify you ourselves at thegodculture.com. Just fill in your email in the pop-up. And friend us on Facebook at thegodculture, space, hyphen, space, original. And coming soon, we are setting up a page on Parlor, a Facebook alternative launching this week. We now have five books published internationally, being read in over 100 countries with our new release now available. Rest, the 400 plus page case for Sabbath. Just go to ophirinstitute.com for all the links for your area for each of our books. Thank you for watching. Now, always remember, prove all things for yourself. Yah bless to everyone.
The Book of Jubilees, the Torah calendar named by the temple priests in Qumran as the source of the exact determination of how to keep Torah's calendar in the Damascus document. Yes, they called it Torah and used it as such. This book renders the very first map of the world, the most ancient geography in all of history. Jubilee is also known as the Book of Division, as Noah partitions the entire earth to his three sons, finds the Garden of Eden in the Philippines, pinpoints the seat of Gog of Magog's power, demonstrates continental divides originate with Noah and much more. It is the second witness to Genesis and Torah and concurs. It tests as Torah and we encourage you to review this full test for yourself in the beginning of this book. It was the priests who were exiled from the temple who lived in Qumran, known in Bible times as Bethabara, where Messiah was baptized and John the Baptist of temple priestly caste lived and operated as these were his fellow Levite priests exiled from the temple, who continued to keep scripture there, as well as operate a function, compound, modeled in part after the temple. This is the only historic library of precedence for the Old Testament canon in ancient history, yet explained away in willing ignorance, just as 2 Peter 3 Warm. Based on the R.H. Charles translation from the Ethiopic, this book will enlighten and its revelation will rock your world. As all 50 chapters appear in this book with curated and edited margin notes in large print Bible format, easy to read. This 288 page quality paperback has a high resolution section of maps that represent the world's oldest map by Noah. Read it and test it for yourself, and you will likely find, as we have, this book is inspired, even canon, in history. Available free worldwide in ebook, or purchase a print copy today on Shopee Philippines or Amazon internationally. Just go to bookofjubilees.org, and the links are there for your area. We also offer bundle pricing with our other books in the Philippines. Our books are already expanding now, being read in 52 countries and more than half of the provinces in the Philippines. Join thousands who are finding this useful in their lives.